Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Gato. My name is Hans. I'm Edward. And we're your hosts for now and forevermore. <laughs> or until we succumb in like post COVID party or something. <laughs> um, if you're new, <laughs> welcome to the, one of the best variety podcasts on the internet. If you are a regular listener, welcome back, bitches. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I don't even know why I'm always laughing at that. Um, so if you are new, Giddle is a variety of podcasts about gaming, entertainment, technology, and lifestyle, all wrapped up in a wonderful geek eco-friendly box i would go with delay because i mean we're experiencing yeah we're, one now. We're, there is a bit of a delay <laughs> um <laughs> so for, for those of you who have been listening and for the you new listeners um we've adapted our process in terms of how we record the podcast namely in terms of future proofing it so that should one of us travel or go abroad or you know just be unavailable at our normal premises for recording that we can still do this and so last week we used skype to varying degrees of success and this week we are now using facetime but i guess it doesn't matter what we use there is delay <laughs> <laughs> oh, ever so always. slight i might add ever so yeah, slight yeah. anyway uh, welcome to episode 37 um we hope you'll enjoyed 36 and all of the previous ones and for today's episode, as per usual, we will kick off with some news reviews and previews before getting into our delicious content and then NSFW. <laughs> All right. So kicking off our reviews, news and previews. Oh, actually, just before we do, um, some of the astute and observant amongst you sort of dm'd us last week and we're all like oh we know what the secret is that you're alluding to oh. we cannot confirm nor deny <laughs> yes. the accuracy <laughs> of your <laughs> statement um but we will say that you are kind of maybe on the right path if that gives away anything of course should we be so lucky next week you will all know if you do watch and if you listen of course we will speak about it but until then back to our regular programming <laughs> okay so um i recently watched uh la revolution on netflix which was really good if i must be okay. honest um, good. I mean, I, good. Saw, I saw the trailer and I was wondering, like, oh, you know, this looks very interesting. So I'm going to speak about the show now as best as possible, trying not to be spoilery. But, you know, they give a lot of weight in the trailer anyway. So mm. I will sort of try and speak around that. Um, but even if I, I believe even if I tell you what the general premise is, I don't think it takes away from the general plot. Mm. So La Revolution takes place in 17th century France. And it has to do with um, the reign of Napoleon Bonaparte and uh, King Louis and how, you know, if you know history, you, you know how there was obviously the revolution and, um, you know, how, how the, the commoners, for lack of a better term, or the bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie rebelled against the, you know, the kings and queens of the time, the monarchy, because they yeah. felt that, um, you know, th th they were being done dirty if there's another <laughs> there's a better unfairly treated <laughs> yeah. yes unfairly treated and you know for the yeah. most part they were i mean if you do go back and look back then uh you know the royals of the time were really being you know had opulent lives whereas you know there was a lot of poverty anyway so la revolution it it looks at that but it has a really cool sci-fi spin to it which was not necessarily unexpected because if you watch the trailer, they, they they talk about blue blood. Okay, now everyone who knows of history and the monarchies and things and royals has heard of blue blood, which is meant to signify um, somebody of noble descent. So that <laughs> gets taken to another level in La Revolution, whereby there's something special about blue blood and what it does to the royals and how it's a legitimate thing and it's not made up. <laughs> Is it a scientific thing or a natural thing? 
Okay, so I won't I won't spoil where it comes from or how it happens or whatever. What I will say is that it turns out there's actually this overarching plot by the nobles to give people the power of blue blood. And in so doing, the rebels find out about it and try to stop it from happening. And that's how the whole show plays out. But it's just, it's, it's really exceptional because they take that wonderful history and they just give it that fantastic conspiracy theory spin, you know, where you're like, oh, you know, and, and like, I don't want to say too much, but the way that the nobles who have blue blood begin to act, you're kind of like, wow, that makes a lot of sense as to why they did what they did back then, you know? Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's, okay. So other than that, I'll say that the cinematography is, it's outstanding. It's beautifully, beautifully, beautifully shot. And it has some of the most incredible audio as well. Um, mm. I actually shared a, a song this week, which Edward knew a lot about the composer, which really surprised me. And that was one of the uh, the tracks that they played. It's just phenomenal. It's just beautiful. It's really sad, but there's reasons for it. Anyway, if you are looking for a very, very good period drama that has a wonderful sci-fi spin to it, I highly, highly recommend La Révolution. And, and what makes it even better is that it's based in France, but it's a fully French produced show. So it's not like, you know, more recent Netflix dramas where it's German, but they all speak English, you know, and you're like, or, that doesn't make sense. You know? Or like Bank Heist, <laughs> which was Swedish, but dubbed in English and it was so bad. Yeah, exactly. So it's really just a very good show. Now, sure, mm. along the way, every now and again, you know, there'll be a familiar trope that presents itself in you, but like, eh, but... They're, they're few and far between. Just the overall premise is intriguing. And don't believe the score on IMDb. Um, I know that I'm one of those people that kind of has like IMDb as my metric for things that I enjoy and don't yeah, enjoy. But <laughs> I, went, I, went, I went and I looked, I went and I looked. And a lot of people are review bombing it because it's not historically accurate. And I'm like, did y'all bitches even watch the trailer? It's literally in the trailer that this is not, that it's not historically accurate, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's obviously uses history as a base and then has wonderful, you know, twists and machinations along the way that are like sci-fi related. It's, it's very, very good. I, I wouldn't talk about it if I didn't think it was a good show for people sure. to invest their time into. Also, it's only eight episodes, long episodes, about 45 minutes to an hour each, but yeah, well worth it well well worth it and it ends on a cliffhanger so i'm very curious well, look there's more there's so much i could say but i don't want to because it, it kind of ends it, it'll be very spoilery so um it, i'm looking forward to a second season i'm very very curious to know where they're going to go with it given how the first season ended <laughs> it, it actually reminds me a lot of assassin's creed in a way uh, the way you describe mm. it oh so, my gosh yes thank I'm you for bringing that, that up that review no, bomb. Y- yeah so so, um, while watching, I kept on getting super strong Unity vibes, but, um, but not because of the, I mean, obviously we're, it's, it's, it's human, the it's reality, setting. whereas a, a video game, yeah, but, but the setting, and it actually mm. really made me appreciate just how accurate Unity was for its time, yes. given yes. how incredible this show was, but you know, you're spot on, Edward, you're spot on, with a little, like a little side quest, the things that happen in the show, okay, anyway, I'm not gonna, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, so um, other than that, there's there's been like a couple of things going on. We aren't again allowed to mention a lot of it because of embargoes and NDAs. Now, a little bit different to what we spoke about last week because what we spoke about last week, I still couldn't speak oh. about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> count your words anyway, wisely. Anyway, so there's other stuff that we have that Edward is currently busy with. Um, yeah. Again, stuff we can't speak about. So what, what I can speak about, and if you are watching the video, behind me you'll see a uh, like a green logo. It might look familiar to some of you. Essentially, I am reviewing the uh, one of the latest um, Razor, Razor Blades, right? The Razor Blade 15, I think, it's, I, think. Yes. I think that's it, yeah? Yes. 
Um, it's a gaming laptop. Uh, I, I'm happy to give my first impressions. Um, so far, so good. It's thin, much thinner than I thought a gaming laptop would be. Um, it plays games exceptionally well. It gets unfortunately hot. Um, but overall, I actually like it. I like it a lot more than I thought that I would. Of course, I'll I'll wait until next week to actually give you like a proper breakdown of what I think about it. But but right now, first impressions, because I only had it for like one or two days. Um, mm. You know, but but so far so good. What I will say, and what I do want to talk about, and it's so going to make it into my video review if I ever get there, is just how disgusting this laptop was when it arrived for me for review. <laughs> Look. You know, Edward and I have been doing this for many years, right? We've been in this industry for a decade now. And, you know, 90, 99% of the time we get a product, it always goes back. Okay, you know, contrary to popular belief where people think that, oh, you know, companies give out products left, right and center. It's not like that. It, like I said, 99% of the time you will get a product and you will have to send it back to the either the PR agency or directly to the company who sent you the item. Of course, there is the rare one percent yeah. who are like, okay, don't worry about sending it back. This is for you to keep. Um, whether you review it or not is entirely up to you. And when those happen, you know, we are immensely appreciative because they're few and far between. Now, in terms of this laptop, it's a forty-five thousand rand laptop, so naturally it's going back. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> naturally, it's, a, it's an, a very expensive <laughs> device now. Sure, you know, you might wonder, well, then how do influencers do it? How come some other influencers get to keep it? Now, in those circumstances, there's often an agreement in place whereby the company will say, okay, we'll give you this, we'll give you this laptop, but then you have to produce content on it. Now, at Vamers, we have a very hard policy on the fact that we don't accept product or money or anything for review purposes. However, there yep. are circumstances where a company will give you a product regardless of whether you review it or not. And those are normally the, the companies we'll work with. In other words, they give you the product, but there's no, um, there's no, uh, what, what's the word, Edward? There's no, not anticipation. There's no, no, um, th no requirement, I guess. You know, yeah. no obligation. There no we go. That's the word I wanted to say. There yes, go. Th th there's no obligation. So they'll give you the product, but there's no obligation that you tweet about it, talk about it, review it, or do anything. So mm -hmm. when that happens, we're happy to accept product because then there's no pressure on us. And yeah. look, there's only there's only two of us on the team, so we take our sweet ass time whenever we do anything, much to the <laughs> The um, and happy <laughs> PR reps that end up, yeah. uh, you know, speaking to us down down the line. Um, but yeah, so that that's again a more insight into how we work and just how things are. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, as as glamorous as this sometimes seems from the outside, especially when you see influencers. I mean, even the MKBHDs of the world don't often get to keep the products. Like yeah. a lot of like like you know you'll see them and I Justine and a whole lot of other people. They get Apple stuff like before everybody else. But yep. they have to send it back. Then yes, what they always. do, obviously, because they're successful enough, they buy their own products. And then that's often how they do the full reviews. So like they'll use the preview items, then send it back, then use the items that they've actually purchased for review. Mm -hmm. um, you know, also it, it helps abroad when they have like 30 day return full money back guarantees, yeah, that's... which we don't really have that here. So it's not like I'm going to go out, spend 100K on a laptop that I can give back because... In South Africa, especially the iStore, which Apple, we really, really dislike, by the way, um, yep. will charge like a 20% restocking fee. So I would immediately lose like 20K, which is just not worth yeah. it. The moment um, it leaves the warehouse, it's yeah. crap. <laughs> anyway, 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 so that's that's enough about that. Um, yeah, we actually have a lot to speak about for reviews and previews. We're just not allowed to say anything. <laughs> yeah, we have so much. It's it's um, weird, actually. Oh, something I guess I can speak about is um, I will be getting preview screenings of his dark materials so oh, anyone who's yeah. watched the first season um stay tuned to the podcast and vamers as well be well assuming i have the time because it's gonna be very busy the next month um i will have hopefully a review up or I'll, I'll at least talk about it on the podcast as to what the second season is like and if you did watch the first season it was very very good um his dark materials is actually a wonderful adaptation of um mm. philip pullman's books um, it is different, as in the first season actually melded the first two books together to a point. Um, but overall, exceptional series. Um, yeah. Yeah. So anyway. All right. Um, I'm not experiencing it today. We are going to get into the content. But I'm curious, dear listeners, 
Do any of you suffer from tinnitus or tinnitus, depending on... Oh, it's actually tinnitus, uh, apparently, not, not tinnitus. Is it tinnitus? <laughs> what? Yeah, apparently. Apparently, it's tinnitus. I was about like, what butchering <laughs> is that? No, seriously. Because like, I've, I've always said tinnitus, but I yeah. actually have um, a, an acquaintance who is an audiologist. And she, yeah. uh, she just told me, she goes, no, it's, it's tinnitus. That's actually how you say it. Okay. And I was like, well, I'm going to keep saying tinnitus, okay? Tomato, yeah, tomato, but... potato, potato, okay? Anyway. There we go. Tomato, potato. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I found this really cool research about this. So, I mean, well, actually, okay. For those of you who are listening, if you aren't sure what, what tinnitus is, it's that really weird ringing that you sometimes get in your ears. You know, you'll mm-hmm. just sit there and it'll be like a... You know, just like it just happens for like no, for like random reasons. Or, yep. well, sometimes if you, if you get clapped on the side of the head, it happens too. But it's more along the lines of if, if you know, like, like I'll take myself as an example, right? Like sometimes I'll just be sitting, I'm watching TV and then boom, right ear, just like, Wee! and I'm like, what is, you know? So I've actually in the past um, seen a technique and I, I can't remember if you've spoken about it on Gettle or not, um, where to, in order to help the tinnitus go away, well, what you do is you, you take, you take your, your, your two palms, you put your left palm on your left ear, your right palm on your right ear, but your ears towards the back of your head. Then you essentially squeeze your hands on your ears, okay? You tap the back of your, your head with your fingers. And apparently what that does is it causes a kind of um, oversensory stimulation that makes your brain solve the tinnitus. Now, I, I've had varying levels of success with it in the past. So it is something that I, I can recommend because I have tried it. Now, that aside, that aside, <laughs> getting back to the reason why I'm talking about it now is um, this really incredible and brand new research that they've finally published about tinnitus and how they've actually found a, um, a means of curing it for up to 12 months. Now, what is really exceptional about this this clinical trial is that it's one of the the largest ever conducted for tinnitus um and i mean which is something that most people don't know but affects what i think it's 10 to 15 percent of the population um anyway it's it's um we will link to it in the show notes go have go have a read up about it but essentially what Mm. the what the research has proven is that they've, they've created this device which they're calling a linear, I'm assuming I'm, I'm uh, pronouncing that correctly, um, which is developed by Neuromod devices. And it basically consists of Bluetooth headphones um, and, you know, which deliver a sequence of audio tones layered with white band noise. Because obviously white noise helps to counteract the, the you know, that, that high pitched uh, pinging, you know? Yeah. Um, and then in addition to that, there's actually, um, they actually have electrical um, stimulation on your tongue. So it's all mm. like connected. And apparently... This weird combination of electrical stimulation, which apparently has, I think, 32 nodes of electricity, and it just shoots it on your, your tongue. They've actually, they've actually trademarked it as tongue tip. Anyway, um, <laughs> while that goes with the, um, those, those unique audio bands in your ears, it, it, I have a feeling that it sort of does like a weird reprogramming. It, it's kind, it kind of works the same way as what I said just now by tapping your head, that oversensory stimulation. So I think yeah. that what this does is it ge- it sort of reboots <laughs> the brain. <laughs> I mean, look, look, it's, it's, I, it's very interesting. Um, go ahead and read the study. Edward, what do you think? It, it, it sounds fascinating. Uh, in a way, it sounds almost like how our passive no- uh, active noise cancellation works. Um, in that oh, a little bit. Basic, a little bit. Basically, what happens is the mics in the headset will listen to what's around you, like the bird now, and it yeah. would try to mimic that, but but the negative of what it is. So if you look at the graph line with all the stripes, um, it'll get it'll blast the the opposite of that into your ears. Now you don't hear that, but yeah. it cancels out noise. Yes. And this almost sounds like that because. If you only but, get the negative and not the positive, it's white noise. Yes. So, yeah. But with electrical stimulation. <laughs> with that, electrical that, stimulation. That seems to be the key takeaway here, is that you yeah. need some electrotherapy to get rid of your tinnitus. <laughs> e- essentially, which I'll just sit with the ringing. Like, 
<laughs> I don't think I'm going to go to some experiment look, become I just, a mutant. Look, I think it's very cool. I mean, look, I'm not a, a massive sufferer of it, right? So the yeah. the percentage I spoke about just now, the 10 to 15%, those are for chronic sufferers. Those are for people oh, who okay. it doesn't go away. You know, just it stays. It's consistent. So, I mean, I think this is... Uh, it's quite cool. I mean, we're making advances to help people with, with these kinds of mm. things. So, I mean, I, I would try it, you know, see if, if, it, if, I, if I use it in like for a full year, if I don't get any issues, you know? That, that sounds quite, uh, like... Quite interesting. Like something an evil doctor would use against you, you know? <laughs> or, or to make you a, a superhuman or something. Well, as long as it doesn't make us croak, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sorry for that <laughs> very, very bad segue. <laughs> Okay, so moving on to something else that we both thought was quite cool. Um, okay, so we know that languages differ around the world, all right? Um, all languages sort of have different terminology for certain creatures, all right? Yep. Well, apparently the same applies to the way animals make noises. You know, like uh, the way that we would say a cat meows, you know, is different in Japanese. You know, it, 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 it doesn't meow mouth, in Japanese. But... It, it it does something different. Anyway, anyway. Yeah. So the, today's one has got to do with frogs and how, you know, the croak of a frog sounds different depending on the language that you're speaking. See, <laughs> so, that's weird. Anyway, sorry. Why? <laughs> the thing is, how do, does something sound different? It just does. <laughs> look, I, look, I would imagine that this has to do with perception. My you know? It, so, like, I do believe that the language you speak helps you determine the world around you. So, yeah. look, let's, let's have a look at this a little bit, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, in English, apparently it's ribbit, you know, ribbit, 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 ribbit. Makes That's sense. The, the, the sound that a, a frog allegedly makes. Now, if you take that and you apply it to, as I said just now, something like Japanese, for them it's kero kero, kero kero. <laughs> How? <laughs> or for German it's quack, quack quack. <laughs> or, or like, let's see, that makes sense because in Afrikaans we say quack as well. Ah, you see, do you see what but, I'm but saying? Then, but then you get Hungarian, which is brekeke, brekeke, brekeke. <laughs> that sounds like a cricket. <laughs> or um, what Polish? It's kum 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 kum. Or kam kam, if you want to. <laughs> kam kam. Yeah, that's how I read it. Well, we aren't quite there yet. Uh, or Korean. For those of you it's to the podcast. You'll J cool. <laughs> I I don't think they pronounce the G as J though. Hey. Well, we do. I'm sure. I'm sure. I don't know. Gekul. I don't know Korean it, it, at all. Geku geku geku. Get I have no idea. Ooh. I don't speak Korean. <laughs> it sounds like a boy band. <laughs> oh, it does. So, I mean, look, we, we obviously will always link in the show notes to these things. Um, yeah. So we're obviously reading them as they're written. And like the Korean <laughs> one is G-A-E dash G-U-U-L. So it could be Gegul. Gegul. Yeah, or... But it all depends on uh, how a Korean person would pronounce the word G, I presume. Yeah. Or well, any know? of those. Or Italian. Kra, 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 kra. <laughs> like Chinese is guo guo, but yeah, I can't say I've ever heard a Chinese person use a g sound. G a g sound? Maybe it's ho 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 ho. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> maybe. So yeah, it's, Look, it's, it's just, all as you it's said. It's just fascinating, you know. Yeah. So, like, we're, we're talking about like how tinnitus and how that can like affect your your hearing and that. Now we're automatically mm -hmm. moving into how languages determine the way that you can perceive the world. Yep. Hey, isn't it? It's just, I don't know. I just, it's, I thought it was an interesting thing. It's a very small segment that we're talking about now, but it's just really cool. Now I'm curious uh, for those of you out there, if you have any other interesting, um, you know, phrases from different languages that you think we should know about, let us know. DM, yeah. comment on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. <laughs> if you're Russian, I'm partial to that language. So. Oh yes, of course. Let me oh, know. I'm, look, I'm glad that, that um, is French on here. How is French not on here? It is. It is. Is it? No, it's not. Oh, no. I thought it was. It's anyway, not. so I don't even know what it is in French, and I should know. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Moving <laughs> on to torture. So <laughs> yes, which is not what I thought it was all maybe, about. Maybe we'll, you you'll, you'll scream out quack quack when you're being chopped up. Or <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, 
because I was watching La Révolution and there were, there's actually a very funny, um, I, I think they did this on purpose, the people who, who created the show. Uh, so like may, one of the main characters is a doctor and his surname is uh, like, it's guillotine for like chopping off heads. Yeah. Um, and they actually make they make a fun joke in it in French in the show about it. Anyway, um, so obviously I was curious about the time period, and so I was looking it up a little bit, and um, I came across this really awful form of torture that they used to practice in China. Now, um, this allegedly it, it takes place in the, the Zhou Dynasty. I, I remember I'm pronouncing that the, the Zhao Dynasty, I think, um, which oh. is 1046 BC to 256 BC. And um, they used to essentially cut people up as a form of torture. Um, there were three main... Yeah, I know, right? There were three main uh, methods. One was waist chopping, which is literally cutting you in half. Beheading, which is taking off your, your head. And then general dismemberment, where depending on the severity of your crime would depend on how many pieces you were cut up into. And I read a very interesting thing about that as well. No, seriously. Where there was some, um, some poet apparently offended the king or something. So he chopped him up into 12 pieces. Wow. <laughs> I know it's bad, fault. right? It sounds and, and, like and bear in mind, we, we, must, we have to admit that they do this while they're alive. So it's not like they're yeah. dead and then they get chopped up. Okay. It's like cartel now, shit. Like, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. <laughs> so yeah, so the, the main one that I actually want to speak about now is the waste chopping one. So um, it turns out, it turns out that it was, as I said, it was used for a long time, but it was eventually outlawed by the emperor known as Yang Zheng, all right? But do you want to know why? The only reason why. <laughs> why? Okay. So, it, 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 had, it occurred in 1734, which is not even that long ago, if you think about it. No. It's only, what, like 300 and something years, right? Yeah. Um, and... It, it, it's unclear what he did wrong, all right? But he, uh, Yu Hongtu was an educational administrator and he was sentenced to execution by waste chopping. And the thing is, they did it. They chopped him in half. And what happened is he didn't die. So he, he remained alive long enough to, in Chinese characters and using his own blood, write the words for terrible and awful and miserable. Wow. Seven times. He wrote it seven times in his own blood. <laughs> they let him. That's what surprised me. Like, they just no, never mind. Well, around. I mean, well, the, this is the thing. This wow. form of execution was literally just to chop you in half at the waist. That was it. Wait, did, didn't we speak about, like, how you can live... While still being chopped in half or something earlier. I think it was in one of our previous episodes. We talked yeah. about it was decapitation, I think. How many seconds yes. you'd actually be conscious for before before dying. Yeah. So, so obviously So Wow. I mean look this I mean think about this for a second. This is terrible. So he he literally only died because he bled to death. Not Pretty because much. he was unconscious. Oh. You know? I know, right? Anyway, so what happened is uh, when the emperor heard about this 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 um this guy and what happened to him and how he was still alive. He then outlawed the practice of waste chopping. Well, so I guess that's one positive. <laughs> yeah. And, and also, um, do you want to know what, what's, what's very interesting about this? So, um, the, the whole like waste chopping term, right? Um, mm -hmm. it's actually in modern day Mandarin or in modern day China, it's actually used as a metaphor for when a project is canceled. You know, so, it gets chopped at the waist, it gets stopped. And interestingly oh. enough, it's also used to ca for when uh, TV shows are cancelled. They use that, that phrase, that, 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 that waist chopping phrase. Wow. So, so Isn't that we cool? say it well, was I mean, it's not canned, cool, but... <laughs> they say it was wasted. No, not, not, wasted. not wasted, but no, <laughs> the, the, it, was, it was chopped at the waist. You know, it was, it was prematurely wow. okay, ended, that's cool. basically. That's cool. You know? Another it's way interesting. Our languages differ, yeah. Well, well, speaking about your whole wasted uh, remark, Edward, I yeah. will have you know that you are not yet at your peak brain capacity or peak and I will brain have performance. You know that it's only downhill <laughs> from the air. Yes, I you. know. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> what, what we're talking about is now. 
I, I, this study is or is incredibly, incredibly in depth. There is a lot of information. So I'm yeah. really we're only going to discuss this very briefly because it's super, super, super in depth. Yeah. Essentially, the overall takeaway is that your your cognitive performance reaches its max proficiency and efficiency at age 35. And as Edward said, it's then downhill from then <laughs> onwards. <laughs> so th- now well, bear in mind, it's not like it's not like you reach 35 and then it's it's cognitive decline. No. It's, <laughs> you, you you reach 35 and then for about five to ten years after that, it, it sort of plateaus and then it starts decreasing from about 45. Um, now, now, of course, when I say decreasing, it's not like you just become dumb. It's <laughs> it's more along the lines of like when you're at the age of 35, your your brain is allegedly at its peak because now you have a very good um, maturity, first of all. So your brain has reached a level of um, you know healthy maturity, but also you have, and this is weird because they actually considered this for the study, but you have experience and wisdom. So that's mm. why it gets classified as the optimal stage for cognitive performance, because you have both a young and intelligent enough brain to perceive things, but that's also backed by wisdom and um, experience. Mm. So, you know, putting those things together, it means that basically between 35 and like 45, you have like optimal brain performance. <laughs> so even if we like, I mean, I didn't think this, I didn't think so. I was like. You know, if I wanted to study now, how difficult is it going to be? But no, apparently it's actually the optimal time uh, yeah. to really do to, to do many things in your life. Um, now, in, in terms of the study, I just want to speak a little bit about it. So it was very, very, very interesting because, you know, a lot of the times when we speak about studies and things, they're fairly short, you know, or they yeah. have, um, you know, small sample sizes and so on and so forth. For this one, it took place over 124 years which is, I mean, huge. It's insane. 124 yeah. years and over 24,000 chess games. Because what they ended up doing is they used chess as the um, sort of as like the the the, the, the base um, for the study. How people mm. performed when they played chess, and this is how they were able to find the um, sort of the the curve in performance in terms of your peak brain. Um, and and at what age it's the best time, you know? <laughs> that, That's cool. Wow. It's it's it was really very very interesting. Um, and they they observed over 1.6 million move by moves, you know, through the different chess games. Mm. Um, and and they specifically mentioned things. I mean, measured things like speed, memory, visualization, and like the reasoning of information that was processed. And they showed that like that gave them a really good showcase of where the peak is, which is the age of 35, and where the decline is, which is roughly 50 and older. Um, cool. So basically, it's, it stays until about 50. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's really, it was really, really interesting. And also, in addition to that, they say that your brain, um, it sharply picks up in your early 20s. So oh. basically, up until your 20s, you're, you're sort of, like your brain is actually still developing. It's still maturing. Yeah. Um, and then from your early 20s is when it kicks into gear, and that's when you are most proficient at doing things quickly. Oh, that um, makes sense. But and and then it reaches um eventually reaches a plateau with a peak at 35. And then from there it, it it's sustained for many years between well depending on everyone's different. So let's say things between 5, 10, 15 years depending on who you are. And then from then onwards is a there is a sustained decline unfortunately. So, so what um, what you're saying is if at 35 I'm still working slowly and still not multitasking <laughs> <laughs> I'll never be wor- working fast and multitasking. Listen, listen, listen. As per our previous episode, there is no such thing as multitasking. However, however, <laughs> well, um, task switching. Yes. <laughs> if if you're if you're still doing things backward at the time you're 35, <laughs> there's no. <laughs> then 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 I suppose there's a bit of a problem there, and you really don't have much to <laughs> to look forward to. <laughs> But but now, as awesome as the study is, um, they used chess games specifically and chess players. Now, that's yeah. already people who are very analytical and tactical um, to begin with. No, 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 so, no. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You yeah. can't say that. So, remember, we did speak about genius several episodes yes. ago. And how yeah. genius is learned through yes. something like chess. 
Yes. Now, as I, as I mentioned, the study is very in-depth. Mm. It's very detailed. So if anybody is interested, go and read it. There's a lot more information there than yeah, we're even talking about now. Many okay? pages. Um, with, with that said, you know, the act of playing chess, yes, as, as you've mentioned now, it shows aspects of reasoning and strategic thinking and so on and so forth. But that doesn't necessarily make you better than the average Joe. In other words... Bear in mind, when we spoke about genius in the previous episode, that guy purposefully, may, you know, encouraged his kids to play chess for hours a day, yes. therefore honing the skill. Now, these people w- that they got for this this study were not professional chess players. They were just the average Joe, like me and oh, you okay. sitting and playing a game of chess. You with see? a basic understanding. So, with a basic understanding of how the oh, game okay. works. And then, oh, and then okay. it, goes, it goes into depth about how they obviously analyze how people think and you know, the speed at which they made decisions and stuff like that. That's cool. And, you know, it's very interesting because it shows how, like, you know, the younger you are, the more rash and the faster your decisions are. But the older you are, the slower your, dis- your, your speed might be, but the better your decision making is in terms of strategic thinking. Because that- you've obviously had years of playing the game versus somebody who hasn't do you know what i mean that's cool it's a very look it's a very very cool. interesting study there's a lot of really cool takeaways from it then of course having said that you know an older player is much slower but might not necessarily make this the best moves you see that that's sort of how they, yeah. they, they took it and they analyzed it anyway it's very 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 cool now you have to also wonder to yourself could you fool yourself into being a genius by playing by playing <laughs> chess like, <laughs> or are you really one? Is there a placebo effect, Edwin? Yeah, that, that's what I'm wondering now. <laughs> ah, okay. So, mind my painful segue. Um, <laughs> there was another very interesting article. Again, I'm not going to speak much about it just because it's just more of a takeaway point, um, which I leave to you as our audience to think about. Um, there's new research over the last couple of decades with regards to pain medication. And something that I didn't know, or or rather I knew of the placebo effect. And I knew that in most studies, especially for medicine, you have to have a placebo and you have to have the real thing to determine if there is actually uh, a a difference. You know, does this medication actually work or not? All right. And 90% of the time, if the medication does work, the placebo group won't experience the effects because it's Mm. placebo. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, apparently in the last couple of decades um, of placebo trials in specifically pain medication, right? It just so happens that the the differentiating the differential percentage of whether placebo works or not has shrunk in only the United States. As in as in what I mean by that is normally Let's take an example, right? Let's say Panado. Just randomly going to throw it out there. Now, this is not because I'm speaking about fact. I'm just giving an example to illustrate this point. Yeah. You know, you have a test. So you have 10 people on the left, 10 people on the right. Left have placebo, right have Panado, right? And you, ta- mm-hmm. you, you get them to take the pull. The, one of the 10 on the placebo say that they felt no pain. Obviously, mm-hmm. because it's a placebo, so it shouldn't. Whereas nine of the 10 for Panado said they felt no pain. Therefore, showcasing that only 10% of people for the placebo, um, you know, experience the placebo effect, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what this research has shown is that only in the USA has that placebo effect increased to the point that they cannot distinguish a difference between whether the medication is actually working or not in test groups. That's it's the only it's the only Western country that has actually shown that change, as in the, they, they did similar tests in Europe as well, right? And I mean, I'm talking about these are tests over decades now. Hey? This is not just like done in a couple of months or whatever the case is. And they've shown that in Europe the the percentages have remained the same. So you like you know twenty percent of people in the placebo group say that they felt something. All right. Yeah. But that has I mean that that didn't. Oh, you you get what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying? Whereas that percentage has has declined so much in the states that that the difference between the placebo group and the actual medicine group is only something like six percent wow which is nothing like i mean like like yes so 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 what the study then did was it kind of was like okay why is this why is this happening yeah and 
there, there's no definitive conclusion. But, you know, unlike a lot of countries in the world, um, as somebody who's traveled to America and who's actually seen American television, if you ever see an advert for medication, it's always, they, they list off all of the side effects and the symptoms. Okay, in okay. the actual advertisement, whether or not you get them or not, it's in. They have to list it. Apparently, it's by law, right? Okay. So they're saying that that that, coupled with the fact that um, medicine medicinal trials are very professional today, more so than they were thirty years ago. Whereas you know there are doctors there and they have their their coats on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that apparently it's giving people, specifically Western Americans the illusion that what they're taking is the real deal when wow. it's not. But now, <laughs> isn't placebos cheaper? So Placebos are nothing. They're sugar pills, Ed. Exactly, but they're cheap to produce. So many no, but Americans placebo are does saving nothing. money. I know. Well, no, 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 but this is the thing. So the tests are saying that the, the Americans can't tell the difference exactly. between whether so, this pain pill works or not. So... What what is happening here? Is this like is this is this a, a case of Americans are so gullible that they'll believe anything versus something that actually is medically sound? But then exactly. where does that but then where does that put this whole situation? Because if like how do you the, the, how do you know if the tablet works or not? <laughs> See, th that's the thing. If I were Compral now shipping all my mates to America. <laughs> I would put the f uh, in in a little packet of nine pills. I would put the first three as actual comprols and the last six of just placebos, and they no, wouldn't no, would even you, would be able to tell the difference. No, you just you split them. You just do one real, one fake, one real, one fake. <laughs> yeah, or, yeah, and that way people will give me all the monies, and I'll save half of <laughs> half of the you production see, Ed, costs. This is why you are not in that industry because you are an ethical <laughs> bitch. Okay, that's why. Okay, I would be <laughs> all for that money. Hey, all for that sweet money. <laughs> <laughs> that awesome money. Yeah. So look, it's just it's just interesting, and it uh, uh, like the the general consensus was that because things are perceived to be more medicinal, that they believed it to work. Yeah. Look, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, it's, it's a fascinating study and I believe more research needs to be done into why only Americans are exhibiting this. Why mm. only Americans are exhibiting a, um, an increase in placebo versus any of the other nations, specifically Europeans. You know, yeah. like, like, is it because they're ill-informed? Is it because they're just more trusting as people? You know? Um, or it's, it's it's fascinating to me. It's really fascinating. Like, is this some sort of a bias that has come into play because of the way Americans are brought up? Or could it be because you know? of the American diet? Um, like all the sugars is, they have and, and all the, the fatty foods look, Americans that's, consume. That's... I, I would hesitate, I guess, and say no, purely oh. because... Um, Africa, for example, or well, South Africa, anyway, is one of the most obese nations in the world. And so is mm -hmm. the UK. Now, I'm specifically mentioning the UK because this study mentions Europe as a whole. And they, oh, didn't, okay. notice, they didn't notice this placebo effect in any other European country. It, it, in terms of Western countries, it was only America, which oh, had an increase in people saying the placebo works for them when it actually doesn't do anything. <laughs> Okay, that's fascinating. It's interesting. It's interesting. Look, yeah. for anyone who's listening, if you have any thoughts on this as to why you think American people are more susceptible to placebos than the real things, let us know. Like, I'm yeah. genuinely, I'd, I'd love to know what you think. You know, this is something that, that, you know, deserves to be spoken about more and more research done into, you know? It's very, yep. very interesting. It's now, of course, of course, I'm just going to throw this topic out there. <laughs> Moving on to Star Trek. Um, <laughs> um, do, okay, this is an interesting one, Edward. So yeah. you're familiar with Star Trek, right? I am. I am. Okay. So today I want to speak to you a little bit about Spock. You know Spock, right? The, yes. the, um, the alien from Star Trek. Um, well, I mean, we say alien, but he's humanoid, you know, person just with like pointy ears, basically, which would, and he's yeah. a Vulcan, you know, and he does, he does the whole, he does this with his little bowl cut. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, 
So what is interesting about Spock is that he was actually supposed to be a different color than how he's currently perceived in the TV show. He was actually supposed to be a red alien, a red Vulcan. Now, the the, the okay. reason behind this is because he was technically supposed to have b- represented a devil. Um, as in, you know, it, it, yes, does that make sense? Do you hear it now? Do yes. you see it? I can, I can hear it clicking in your mind. Yeah. So the, 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 the reason why he was supposed to be a devil and red is because he was supposed to be the antithesis of what a devil is meant to be. Because we all know that the Vulcan race, um, they revere science and technology above all else, right? Yeah. They do have their own religion though, but more so they believe in good. You know, they mm. only do things for the benefit of other creatures or of society. Yeah. So the original idea for Spock, or a devil Spock, as we're now, as I'm now going to refer it, is he was supposed to be this sort of evil-looking character, but who was truly benevolent, therefore making viewers question what is good and what is evil. Oh. You see? It's interesting, right? How inter- That's interesting is that? That's actually super cool. But... Do you want to know why he was never read in the eventual show? <laughs> I don't know. Was it an actor decision? A director no. decision? No. No. What actually ended up happening is they did a screen test. And bear in mind, Star Trek has been around for a very, very long time. Yeah. Ages. Um, yeah. So they did a screen test and it just so happened that red, it, using monochromatic colors, came across as blackface. Instead of actually, you know, a different color. Wow. That makes you see? sense. So against it's, the green it's, it's backdrop. interesting, right? It's interesting, yeah. yeah. So so they, they purposefully decided not to make him red for that very reason. Because it wow. would have obviously... I mean, of course, no, nobody wants to do blackface. Because you don't want to, you know... You don't, you don't want cultural misappropriation, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was... It's just... It's, it's fascinating how they... How what the original premise was and how they changed it in order to make it more inclusive. I love it actually. That's in, cool. In the grand scheme of things, you know, it's just That's a little actually, interesting tidbit. <laughs> uh, see, I don't like Star Trek, but that goes to show you the inclusion the the people involved yes. have had all that years ago. Look, just remember, just remember, Star Trek has always been about being inclusive. Yes, they've always, in many respects, pushed the boundaries of race, religion. Um, sexual identity and so on and so forth so yep. it's really great to know that even in the very 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 beginning when it started out that they didn't do it because they didn't want to you know disregard anyone or make anyone feel bad it's lovely that's actually cool. that's yeah. actually super cool <laughs> so there we go now you know why devil spark is not red <laughs> <laughs> yeah devil spark is called devil spark <laughs> Well, he's just Spock now, right? So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, now, moving on to something else that I thought was very cool. Um, I, I came across this link for the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, right? It's been around yep. for ages, um, since 1828 to be precise. And with that in mind, they've now launched a new feature on their website called Time Traveler. Now, we've spoken about time travel in the past. This is not exactly that. Um but it has to do with when were certain words put into existence in print for the first time. Mm. So, for example, you know, like when was the word apple? When did that first appear in print ever, you know, in history? I don't know. I can't answer <laughs> it. I'm just saying. BC, I suppose. <laughs> it's <laughs> long, long ago. Most likely During the, the Bible, Bible whatever the case is. Yeah. Now, what this does, though, and what I think is really cool, is it allows you to pick your year of birth, or any year for that matter. And then it actually lists um, all the words that appeared in print for the very first time in that year. So naturally, um, I put my year in, uh, which is 1985. Yes, I am an old man. Um, and the, the, uh, there's a <laughs> quite, quite a lot peak. of words. <laughs> I, I'm in my peak, yeah, peak brain efficiency. Maybe that's why yeah. I find all of this so interesting. Anyway, <laughs> um, the, the the words that I thought were most interesting, I'm just going like, to mention a few of them here for you. So anime, the first time it ever appeared in, and I'm assuming in English print, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, the word anime was in 1985. So y'all be welcome, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, then, other, then there was a phrase, elephant in the room. 
um, drag and drop. How cool! Hey, because okay. you know the, the advent of computers and and uh, graphical UIs. That's um, cool. Quantum dot, which I find really weird because quantum dot has only recently you know come into the zeitgeist in the last couple of years because of Samsung and their quantum dot displays. But anyway, yep. um, sexual predator. Thank you, nineteen eighty five. <laughs> okay i wonder who that was um then biodiversity adway can you believe it that's how long it's of been course. around for <laughs> of course um 24 7 and boy band boy band now boy band i know right <laughs> okay okay now look there, there are a lot more obviously um but these are the ones that that really stuck out to me now with this in mind edward and wow. uh, my our dear fellow readers, I implore you to click the link and have a look. But now I want Edward to do it because I'm curious to see what his are. So I've been checking and <laughs> these are crazy. Okay, so the, the number it's one the year, word that's the year? Up, uh, oh, 1991, fellow listeners. Oh, I'm a young, young, I'm a young boy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the very first word listed is 3D printer. What? All no. All the way back in 1991. In 91. Yes. Wow. I suppose that was some some scientific journal or something. I don't know. It, it was probably the size of a house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It wouldn't surprise me. And then moving down, there's words like autofill, bestie. Oh, wow. Bestie. Yeah. <laughs> um, crowd surfing. Wow. And get this. Cyber sex. Oh, oh, for, okay. That explains for the everything. First time in that <laughs> every, yes, this is hundred percent Edward. Hundred percent Edward. Okay, but but also words like gender non-conforming, granny. What pansies, really? Yeah. Um, wow. Nanotech. Um, pescatarian. I, I'm. Look, I find the gender non-conforming thing very interesting. Yeah, that means it, it's been around for a very long time, so there's no excuse why in 2020 we still have issues. W- yes, Honestly. that's exactly. Hey? Exactly. It's weird that we still have those issues. And oh, then sh- I have words like SIM card. Okay. Oh, I've got caller ID. <laughs> oh, well, there we go. <laughs> and a few words I have no idea what it even means, like Zoodle. Yeah, so, oh, actually, it's, I'm glad you mentioned that. So, you you know Plex, right? Yes. The Plex server. Yeah, I use it Plex daily. first appeared in 1985 in print. Why, I don't know. What for, I'm not sure. <laughs> Plex in all caps but, or just the word Plex? No, no, just the word Plex. Oh. Uh, also, know. also, and Edward, you're going to love this one. You're going to, uh, well, there's actually two here because I'm seeing another one here. Latte, you're oh, welcome. Of course. Of course. <laughs> I love my and, and hold on, hold on. Crack house. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. You, Thank you, ladies. You with your <laughs> birth. Jeez. The birth wow, of crack house. Wow. This is amazing. Look, this is absolutely incredible. So I, you know, both of us would love for you, our listeners and watchers, go check it out. Let yeah. us know. Just like, tell us what are you, some of your favorite words that appeared in print for the very first time in your year of birth? Yeah, I mean it's it's such a it's such a cool thing. Now, with yes, w- what was that term, Edward? That special term that we know th- describes you? <laughs> <laughs> cyber sex. Well, we're ne- with not cyber there yet. sex on the mind. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to NSFW. <laughs> uh, you're kind of jumping the gun a bit because I really want to speak about something oh. else for a second. <laughs> <laughs> so, with all of that in mind, words and all, um, <laughs> did you know that Vigo Mortensen can speak a plethora of languages? How now, many? Well, at least seven has been documented, but no one really knows how many. So, do you think there's more? Yes. Now, the, the reason no one knows is because he's a very private man. We don't know anything about yeah. his private life except for who he's married to or was married to, I guess. Yes, um, yes. Now, now, for those who don't know, Viggo Mortensen is the guy who played uh, Aragon in Lord okay, of the Rings. But that makes him a polyglot. Yes. 
Yeah, and he speaks That's so it cool. fluently. So, so what because happened is that was, I was that was my next question. I was going to be like, is it fluent or is it broken? No, it's mega fluent. Um, I That's found, amazing. I ma- found the most fascinating YouTube video of all the speeches he's given in different languages. And in this video, he speaks English, Spanish, Danish, French, Italian, and Catalan. Okay. Also, no, so that's the seven languages. <laughs> also, Jeez. he's been documented to speak fluent Elvish while on set with Liv Tyler because she can speak fluent Elvish. So that's eight languages, what? <laughs> of which one is fictional, and we don't even know if he can speak more because he just pitches okay. up to interviews and speaks the language. <laughs> They can speak Elvish? Wait, wait, that that is what I'm getting from this. How how amazing are these two actors? Yeah. So Liv Tyler, I don't know if she speaks more than just English and Elvish, but yeah, no, but she the, can but the speak fact English. that she even speaks it fluently is incredible. Yeah, it's fascinating. Now wow. and this video is old. The video um we'll we'll link to in the show notes. Um but yeah. the way he speaks, it's like he knows this language, uh, these languages inside and out. It's fascinating. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing, Edward. Wow. Yeah. It's wow, super part, cool. So a, you, know, you know, this doesn't surprise me now because you've all heard of, well, if you haven't, we'll, we'll speak about it quickly. When they were shooting Lord of the Rings, I'm not sure which one. I don't know if it was one, two, or three. Um, there was actually a scene where he, he broke his toe, his foot, okay? Mm-hmm. But in that same scene, um, somebody threw a knife at him and he actually caught it. Before I know, it that, almost that was, caused severe that was damage. Fellowship of the Ring, um, where where, Is it? where he goes to Frodo and the Hobbits inside that ring where the wraiths come down on them. That's where he catches the sword, I believe. Well. The, the, the thing is, all I'm saying is, we now know that he's a polyglot genius, and then yeah. he has expert reflexes. So, is Viggo Mortensen an alien? Or uh, superhuman? Some overlord <laughs> archetype, because, gosh. Yeah, it's amazing. Oh, I wonder, I wonder what else you can say in those oh, languages. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I tried to find more videos and I couldn't. So, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Wow, geez. Well, speaking, so he can speak seven different languages, right? Yep. Right? Well, Edward, there are 20 different kinds of penises. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there are. Welcome to <laughs> NSFW. <laughs> Um, yes, there are many kinds of penises or peni. I love how pe- we just go from like penis. languages to peen. Just like it's of this. course, language is a beautiful language. <laughs> if you can't seduce your so, what even are you? I well, know? Viggo Mortensen can do it in seven plus languages. Exactly. Oh, oh, I'm getting more just, if you include his peen, about right? There we go. <laughs> so, language so of love. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, not all people are alike, okay? Um, yeah. We all have different bodies, different languages, different head sizes. Now, when it comes to the penis, oh, oh, oh. okay? Yes, definitely different head sizes. Yes. Now, now when it comes to the <laughs> penis, as Hans said, there are differently different, differently different <laughs> head sizes. Um <laughs> Ranging from the normal, I say in air quotes, average yeah, penis no with, thing. yeah, and then yeah. there are something like the the grower, the shower, and obviously. So, so yes, yes. With that in mind, I came across this fascinating little post uh, from Healthline, which is a publication that prides themselves in their their um, medically sound and accurate posts. So okay. this one was written by. Uh, I I wrote it somewhere. Uh, anyway, it was written by a, a staffer from Healthline and overseen by someone else, um, an actual medical I see here the, the contributor is Adrian Santon Langhurst, uh, overseen there we go. by Chicago-based therapist Jennifer Littner. Yeah, there we go. Now, now, now Healthline go. has an entire list of medical professionals that oversee all their posts to make sure it, I it, like that. it's not yeah, fake news. Yeah, I dig that. That's good. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And in this huge ass list, they basically go through different types of penises. Um, but the, it, 
it's not a, a fact of whether they are good or bad. It, it's they they actually list what every single penis is good for. Um, so <laughs> yeah, it's an inti- well. I'm actually I'm list. actually reading ahead here, and I'm not gonna lie. I'm 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 very happy with what I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should be. Um, I say that as if I have any knowledge of what you're yeah, referencing. Yeah, yeah. You you have no <clears throat> no inclination. Of um, the- <laughs> so the list goes through basically everything um, from the curved upward penis, which m- many men have, to the curved downward penis, um, and Essentially, what it says is the curved upward penis, for instance, it's very good for normal penetration because it stimulates all the spots that need stimulating. All oh, damn good spots. Uh, conversely, though, <laughs> the curved downwards penis uh, might make a little bit difficult in missionary, but all the rear entry positions in penetration. All them best positions. <laughs> it's actually perfect for those. Now, now going further down the list, they, they explain yeah. how the bigger base with narrow head penis has solid perks, which is how its narrow head makes it easier for penetration, while its thick base essentially makes it better for penetration in a tiered way. It'd be multi-tiered action. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and kind of then, kind of like like business business in the front, party at the back. <laughs> that's literally what it is, I guess. Um so <laughs> I'm getting weird images. So obviously there's a lot and this list is huge. So, yeah, so yeah. you said there's, um, there's twenty roughly. Yes. Now now <clears throat> it also goes into lengths and girth okay. sizes. Um, and when mixed together, because obviously a length is nothing than just length, but if you mix it yeah. with the other ones, you'll get quite interesting results, like how the average <laughs> peener or the average penis is actually shorter than you might think. But I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, we all know this. Yeah, we, we do, but you know men. Yeah. Uh, but what really gets me, though, um, is all the names they've given most of these penises, these types of penises. Do, do you have some examples for us? Yes. So, essentially, the curved upwards and downwards penis is referred to as a banana. Okay? It's the no, banana Wait, wait, wait. wait, wait. No, hold on, hold on. But, but you mean for either direction, whether up or down, it's just called a banana? Yes. Yes, so that they just call that the banana penis because it's so curves uninventive. Like a banana. Okay. I know, but <laughs> but and here's the kicker. Stuff like the narrow base large head penis, they just outright call a hammer because it looks like a <laughs> hammer. <laughs> or how or how the the average size penis is just the cucumber. Uh, but the average the, What do you mean? Wait, what? Why? Why they just call it a cucumber? Yeah, or the kielbasa <laughs> is the shorter than average penis. Now, I don't know what a kielbasa is, do you? No. Uh, I thought it was some food thing. Um, but yeah, so, and then uh, the salami. It is, it's a sausage. <laughs> oh, okay, well. Then. It's a type of meat sausage from Poland. <laughs> <laughs> How does it look average? Shorter than average. It looks delicious. <laughs> what do you want me to <laughs> say? <laughs> It looks, well, it looks like Kaban, it looks like Kabanossi. I mean, well, on the topic of meat <laughs> sausage, the salami is the larger than average bean, while the pencil is the same but with narrower girth. Ah, okay. Now, oh my gosh! So, so, so hold on. So, the term pencil dick is legit. Yes, it's it's <laughs> it's larger than in length, but a little tiny oh. thin thing. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it. it the list also goes into penises with freckles, <laughs> penises with hair, penises that's been circumcised, uncircumcised, and they even list growers and showers. It's I a long had, list. Look, I had no idea yeah. there were so many names. Like, why? N- I, I don't know. Is, is there a vag equivalent of this? I will find out. But, but my mission this week was to talk more about the penis because I've been talking about the vagina for so much now. I've been desynthesized. And you know why? It's lovely. We love Yonic. Yonic imagery. Yonic everything. <laughs> well. Um, no, but I'm, I'm genuinely curious that, though. though like, because, yeah. Look, look I, I'm curious though. Because like a like, butterfly what would or then flower. Be, 
the <laughs> yes yes exactly like like with, with exactly you're right would it be like this is the rose and this is the daisy and this is the, you know what i mean like like is, do they have their own terminology because like, like actually... you're mentioning all of this now and it's weird like why did they pick a polish sausage why what does that have to do with anything i don't know <laughs> I and how, they... how do you go from how do you go from cucumber to salami? <laughs> <laughs> because it's an edible. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's all edible allegedly. Okay? Yeah, apparently. except for the hammer. If you're eating hammers, you've got a problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you do stuff with the hammer, though. You pound with it. Um, yeah, you, yeah. Of course, you, you get pounded good with that. <laughs> the <hammer. laughs> now, now, this all goes to say that. People gonna get tiny... nailed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gonna get nailed with my significant other's hammer. Okay, okay. So I, I see here. Uh, um, you said that the, the, the kielbasa, which we've now known as a Polish sausage, and you said yeah. it's shorter than average. Blah blah blah. Yes. That's leading us directly into the next po- the next topic, right? Where yes. smaller is better. Okay. I have to hear this because uh, okay, so, because so you know not... that the general the general stereotype and rhetoric. Mm-hmm. is all about being bigger. So yeah. tell me about this one now. <laughs> okay, so obviously people with, with smaller penises exist, okay? Uh, the, the derogatory <laughs> term is the micro-penis. Okay. <laughs> Turns out that the smaller it is, the better you might have life, experience ah. life. Because what, what do you mean? You, you mean the longer you live? Not necessarily. Well, I guess if you have more sex. Um, according to a study, a study published by the, sex, the Journal of Sexual Medicine, only yes. 15% of people have penises larger than, se- uh, larger than seven inches, whereas only 2% after that have penises larger than eight. Now, now, so it's, the, it's a minuscule the, portion of the, the population. The population. Then. But the reason and, I mentioned And somehow is, they all landed up in the porn industry. <laughs> I think so, yes. <laughs> now, the reason I mentioned this specifically is to, to bring home the fact that even if you think your penis is tiny or tinier than average, chances mm. are great you're actually in the average um, and you'll actually get through life quite easily uh, because... Okay. The average penis only reaches around seven inches. Oh, listen to me. Only reaches to about five I'm like, inches. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I don't know where you're getting your averages from. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, five inches when erect. Um, th- that's quite something. I didn't know that. But men with six inches no, or less penises. No, it's more than five. Oh, okay. So you mean that's the average? Yes. That, that's the, the. Only. Yes. Okay. Only around five. No, no, I assume that's the entire five inch range. So five one to five nine. Um, oh, oh, fair enough. Fair okay, enough. Okay, yeah, they yeah, didn't yeah, go yeah. into exacts. But according okay. to the Huff- yeah, yeah. Huffington Post, men with six inch or less penises. So that's why I'm saying I think it's up to five. Oh, nine. okay, that that makes sense then because I was going to say you know like an inch doesn't sound like much. But yes, it is. But, but it's actually an entire little. Yeah, it's like a it's like quite sizable. Yeah. Okay, yeah. All right. Cool. So. Men with six or uh, six inch or less penises are actually able to partner with anyone they wish, mainly because of just it's it's more it fits, um, it, it fits <laughs> yes, but uh, it's more compatible with the greater population of women and even okay. male partners. By the way, I didn't add that okay. into the show notes, but it's mentioned. Okay. However. Um, guys with lengthy penises always have to take extra steps because it comes down to girth. It comes down to the fact that they can't penetrate as easily or as quickly. Or, or, or it's also deeper uh, because yes. you can hit the cervix. Yeah, Exactly, which is a very, yeah. very sensitive area. It's um, sore, yeah. so, so in other words, they have to take extra steps like lubing it up, easing their partners into the, their size or length. Um, yeah, yeah, and yeah. also, many men with with longer penises have actually come out and said, um, "It's not great to be that l- long because I can't, in uh, my penis can't be enveloped in my partner all the way." And oh, I that's, never, yeah. I never knew this, but that's that's a, a big mental thing for many men um, because you want to go inside. <laughs> 
And while you're in halfway, that's all everything your girlfriend can take. Do you want to know what's interesting about this as well? Mm-hmm. It has to do with overall performance. So yes, obviously I, I'm a, I'm a uh, I, I browse Reddit a lot, obviously. Yeah, and I've come across a lot of interesting posts where um, women will outright say they're happier to be with someone who is somewhat less endowed because they try a lot harder. Yeah. You know, whereas somebody who thinks that they, they're they very well endowed will just do the base. Not care. Get themselves off and think that they're, they're you know, gods now because, yeah. you know. I- I've heard yeah. about that it's as well. Very it's quite fascinating. So it's actually, it's interesting how you mention how that can be a bit of a psychological thing for them themselves. And maybe that plays in part of it. Maybe I, they feel that, mm. oh, you know, b- b- because of the, the size, they don't have to do much. But then when they see the displeasure, they're not really sure why. Yeah, I get that. You know, and then and then also, yeah, anyway, it's, it, I'm, sure it, I'm sure it all, like, correlates. I'm, I'm certain you're onto together. something, actually. Um, because uh, on the topic of partners and displeasure, many, many women, according to this Huffington Post <laughs> article, have come out and said that men with smaller penises are just easier to give blowjobs for. Uh, and... It mainly, or one of the main reasons is because it's less straining on the mouth and jaw. Okay, I can see your <laughs> face. And, I'm not saying anything. Mm-hmm. So, essentially, yeah, it, it can sometimes be straining on the jaw. Uh, such as with partners with, I don't know this long word, but TJ, TJD, uh, which is what I have. Temperamandibular. Pre- yeah, is something temporomandibular. Yeah, yeah, you're correct. Oh, is that is that to do with, with the the jaw tightness? Yeah, so that's when when your jaw when the <gasps> I end actually, of your jaw I actually has a little bump a on it. A very good yes, I actually have a very good friend who suffers from that. Yes, now, and it was it was actually. I mean, I'm not naming names, but um, she actually had to go and have like uh, Botox injected into the muscle in order to help loosen it and that. Wow. And um, let's just say that they, her and her husband have an agreement <laughs> because that is never happening ever again, <laughs> unfortunately. It's purely, seriously, the doctor said, she said that she can't. She's wow. not allowed. So to yeah. do more Botox? No. Oh, to do, okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. That's sad. Anyway, yeah, maybe, little, maybe the fine, husband is stuff. well in doubt then, I suppose, because <laughs> apparently giving blowjobs to a, a tinier, shorter, and thinner penis is just easier for people suffering from this. And yeah, okay. that's quite fascinating. So the point is, if you have, if you think you're tiny, you can rest assured that you'll probably go through life with ease. Whereas those of us with, <laughs> who have been well endowed yep. need to take a few extra steps. Now, just a few more. It's in, not too in, bad. Hey, Edward. In re- <laughs> just a few more. Um, in researching this, I came across another. I see. It's like it's not post. stopping. The facts keep going. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a whole lot of lists. Okay, today, but lists are good. So. 10 penis facts. I'm not going to list all of them, but okay, I'm cool. going to go through the yeah, main yeah, yeah. ones. Just, just give us, give, give us a, a, a few, because I'm sure if we, if we had to do all 10, we'll speak for another hour. <laughs> okay, so surprising fact number one. Did you know that babies sometimes exit the womb with an erect penis? But, you know, you know, this is the thing. We've spoken about this before in a previous episode. Mm-hmm. Y'all, that happens for almost any reason. Yes, it, does. it doesn't mean that you're aroused or anything like that. It just happens. What this means, especially, though. Especially in little kids. Yeah. So, uh, I just didn't think that erections were really possible before the age of, like, 10 or whatever. Uh, what, what do you mean? They're I can't always remember possible. that way back. <laughs> anyway, it's, as, yeah, it's yeah. possible as early as in the womb. Um, and this of com- course. It's this goes back to, work. to a study from 1991 where they found that all of these erections usually occur during REM sleep, which is the same as in adults. And it can oh, occur numerous wow. times every hour. Um, That's amazing. And yeah. Now, did you know that the penis is actually sort twice as long as you think? We were just on Wait, the topic of hold length. On. <clears throat> Be- before you continue, I am now curious. Yeah. About if 
they're able to measure that at a young age if that determines your penile health later on in life. I don't think so, because in the previous as, as, post... As, as, in, as in, hold on, wait, wait, hear me out, hear me out. Mm-hmm. So, obviously, this would have to be a whole new study, and it would have to be a long-term study, as in you'd have to measure participants from before birth through to being like 60, 70. Yeah. Okay, so it would be an incredibly long study. Mm -hmm. But what if there could be a correlation between the number of, um, what, baby erections Erections. to determine (laughs) your health, to determine your health at an older stage? Like, what if the frequency as a baby could somehow determine your proficiency later on? Look, it's just a thought. I don't know. I'm just spitballing here. But it just just made me think about it. That's a fascinating thought, though, because... Um, I don't think it can because fetal erections is not the same as what what you do as you grow older. Like you, you start to smoke, you start to drink, you start to take drugs, yes, and yes, all of that obviously saying. has an influence on how. Good okay, okay, yes, you are. that's that that is true. That is that is so, true. Also, the older you get, you 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 re- you request um, an erection for a different reason. Exactly, it's more forcefully trying to get one, right? Versus what we're talking about being. Natural. Involuntary. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so okay. maybe. But, but you see, no. But it it is it is. I mean, I'm not saying it's related. But the thing is, the older a, a man becomes, the yeah. less frequent the natural one occurs. Anyway. Yes. Yes. That's just part and parcel. So maybe of it. So, how frequent so, you did it at baby. There. That. That's. That's uh, what I'm wondering about. Now, of course, I, it, it could be totally unrelated, completely. Yeah. You know, but or I don't it know. Be, it's just something I've sort of. Anyway. Maybe you're on to something that no one else has done before. Someone's going to listen not. to this episode now and write a <laughs> thesis on it. Um, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, so, yeah. So what was the, 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 yeah? Yeah. So moving on to the second bit is, did you know that your penis is actually twice the length that it actually is? I did. Oh, I do. Okay. okay so so <laughs> much like to, to the readers who didn't, much like how the thumb works. Um, obviously, it's just this. It's the shortest finger, right? It's actually not because the thumb actually it's not extends a all the way it's a there. Thumb. Yes, the thumb. What? Yeah. Okay, that I didn't know. Okay, I so, thought the thumb was just there. No, see, if you, that's why you can do this. <gasps> I didn't. Oh, see, now you're blowing my mind. See, so the thumb is actually. So, for much for, a, for those of you who are listening, what Edward is describing is, generally speaking, if you look at your thumb, right, you can bend it in two places. Yeah. One that appears to be um, reaching the palm, and then again between that and the tip of your thumb. But what he's saying is, if you move your full thumb, like let's say if you move it from your thumb to your pinky, you get them to touch, your whole portion of your palm actually moves forward. So that's what he's referring to. Yeah. And he's saying that that's actually all the thumb, therefore meaning the connection actually goes from the tip of your thumb all the way down to your wrist. Yeah. The, the wow. thumb is technically I did not, one of the I did longest not fingers. Know that. Yeah. That's incredible. So so you're blowing my mind a little bit. <laughs> in knowing that now, the same is with the penis. Now, obviously the penis doesn't have a bone like it does with many animals and stuff. Correct. But yeah. it has erectile tissue. And that yes. actually goes all the way in up to the scrotum. Um, and it cools yes. around like a little shrimp almost. <laughs> and that's about double the length of what you can see on the outside. So, so do you know why I know this? Why? Because, um, I mean, come on, let, let's be real here. We, we do a lot of research. We do a lot of reading, right? Yeah. And naturally, um, one of the few things that has popped up in the past is, you know, botched penis surgeries. And oh, okay. um, one of the, no, seriously, like one of the lengthening techniques is where they actually cut one of the tendons um, from the actual member where yeah. that attaches to your pubic bone, and that gives you almost up to two inches extra. Wow! But then you have to, but then you have to, um, you have to use weights allegedly afterwards for several months in order to ensure that it doesn't reattach again. Because if it does, you'll actually end up with an even shorter one than before. Wow! Isn't it? I know it's it's, fast, it's it's well, yes, of course. Who I don't want, I don't want to do it. I have no need for it. But I'm just saying. That people, you know, have done it and it is a means of like elongating it, at least from a length perspective. Wow. Um, And I just thought it was fascinating. That's actually how I inevitably learned about how 
it actually goes really deep into the body and it's not just what you see externally wow so it's okay. quite uh, it's quite quite fascinating yeah it is super fascinating actually <laughs> Jeez, okay so well, well. so now, now i see now look like so something else that we do know as well and i see you've written it there because like you just mentioned how we don't have a bone and that it's it's just um it's tissue yes but you can break it, correct? Yes. Everybody knows how Madonna broke Dennis Rodman. Okay. So, yes. <laughs> so essentially, when it breaks, um, because it's not bone, it's it's just uh, the rapturing of the tissue surrounding yeah. the the bit that can engorge in blood, which makes it erect. Yeah. Now, this mm. sounds horrible. Apparently, it it sounds like uh, a a weird crackly noise because I actually went and searched for videos. <laughs> what? <laughs> Not no. videos, sorry, did you sound really? samples. Yes, I did. I didn't link them here, but I did. And it sounds horrible. Um, and according to okay, this post. Wait, 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 wait. I need to stop you there. I need to stop you there. Yeah. Because we are going to play it. A good for idea. You right now. Oh. Right. Mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> exactly. I'm done now. Thank you so much now, for coming and participating, everybody. <laughs> now, now, if that happens to me, I might die. Okay. Because well, I, holy I, look, crap! Look, look, I have a high pain threshold, as I found out. But yeah. I do think there are certain things where, like, I think if I had to see that, if I had to see it bent, and that, if I had to hear that noise, I would. I think I'd probably pass out. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's. I think I, yeah. Now, now, on the topic of passing out or dying, another fact they list is... That, oh, what? <laughs> yes. So, obviously, I, we, we mentioned how you start life with an erection, okay? Oh, you also, uh, yes, I know that. Okay, I know that. You also end life with one. Now, not everyone, obviously, but many men... Most people, yeah. Actually, not the entire body goes stiff, not just your limbs <laughs> okay if you die now <laughs> no now this list is long and skipping it um it also details percentages of where men actually rise so so on a on a little i forgot what it's called but the the thing that shows the degrees of something so going around degrees the angles right yeah, yes okay. so, uh, um from the flaccid state you, the assumption is that many men go at least 90 degrees or higher, okay, from flaccid downwards pointing. Uh, oh, 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 I see, oh, I see what you're saying. I was, I was just going to be like, what? <laughs> okay, so, so w when the penis becomes erect, it, it Okay, rises. so in other words, if, 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 we, if we take, like, let's say, um, let's take a 180 degree angle. Correct? Yes, yes. And we're, what we're saying is 90 degrees is fully down. Yes. 45 degrees is midway and zero degrees is fully up. Correct? Well, zero is down, 30 is midway and 90. Oh, so sorry. Okay, 90 fine. is midway and 180 yeah. is up. That's how they did this. Okay, anyway. fair enough. Okay, now, okay. it turns out yeah, that yeah. only 31% of men have their penises point between 60 and 85 degrees, which is not even horizontal, if, if that makes sense. Um, while oh, twenty percent of men and a further five percent of men go yeah. beyond that, they go be ninety between ninety and okay. But, um, okay, but what's better though, or nothing really? There's no it's, real. It's not about being uh, being better. It's more just a fact. Um, I don't think it this affects at all how you use your penis well then again i shouldn't even be asking that question after our previous discussion because it, it turns out it doesn't matter exactly it's all about the, right. the type of penis you have more so than yeah. where they point <laughs> but conversely only five percent of men actually have their penises point downwards in other words between zero and 30 degrees which is essentially it gets erect but it doesn't rise i've seen that before yeah, me as well. And I always thought yeah. it's just like someone who didn't bother or something. Haven't you noticed that, that, that okay, I mean, let's all be real here because we speak about the NSFW a lot. Haven't yeah. you noticed that a lot of the times those are those ones that are super well endowed? Yes, I have. So yeah. it, could be, yeah. it could be a muscular thing, a body thing. Well, it's not, it's not exactly it. I'm just saying 
that from what we've seen on TV, mm. generally those huge, huge ones don't go, go up very much. Yeah. Uh, and I just think yeah. it's your body just can't handle the weight. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> no, it can. I'm just saying generally. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, and it also lists growers and showers um, essentially half, Very interesting half. stuff, yeah. Yeah, and also the cornflake myth about preventing masturbation. It's fake. The what now? The what myth? <laughs> so we all know cornflakes started... Uh, the, the, the entire marketing hype surrounding cornflakes and the reason you should use it in the morning comes from the fact that they marketed towards um, not getting aroused during work period, work hours, and what? during school. I have I have never heard of this before in my life. Really? Cornflakes, Kellogg's cornflakes. Yeah, the uh, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, the guy that that founded cornflakes <laughs> and created cornflakes. Yeah? that's how they marketed yeah? it as. Many people what? still believe this to be true, that it you can't get an erection when you eat cornflakes. It doesn't rouse you. Are you kidding? What? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Took- that was an actual selling point. Who in their right mind would want to eat it? <laughs> it, it, it okay, so the, the post says it was meant to lead Americans away from the sin of masturbation. Cornflakes. Yes, <laughs> I could. <laughs> uh, I know. I don't know, but apparently, many people, um, including people I know, old people I know, still believe this to be true. And wow. it's not. It's, it's a had myth. No idea. Yeah. So, well, of course it's a myth. Of course it's it, a myth. That's wow. It's just sugar and corn. It is all it is. What? Edward, you, you've you've blown my mind a few times now in this NSFW section. Thank you. That's the power because, of this, I mean, baby. That's, this is great. I mean, unfortunately, we've reached the end of it now. Yeah. So, NSFW. But, wow, what a great segment. Yeah. Going from cornflakes to your thumb. Wow, wow, <laughs> yeah. wow. In that sound, even. So, th- that's, wow. Okay, interesting. Very, thank you. Awesome. Yeah. I, I, can't, I can't believe it. End of episode 37. <laughs> yep. Uh to those of you who've joined us, thank you so much. As always, um, we and we all, and we say this at the end of every episode, but we really mean it though. Um, you know, we love the submissions, we love the DMs, we love the comments. And to the few special few of you out there who leave us really long and good feedback, thank you. You know who you are. Yep. Um, next week, we're hoping we can reveal some of the secrets. Actually, there'll be two things we, that, well, well, one definitely we will speak about because we already have it in our possession. The second one remains to be seen, but we, we can't say what just yet. And then there's a third one coming up as well, which we still can't say anything about. But in the near future, <laughs> it's been a, let's just say it's been a very, very, very exciting week for us. Very exciting. <laughs> two weeks, actually. Yeah. Very exciting two weeks for us. Um, Edward, this has been a pleasure as always. Wow. Thank you. I love, 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 love that last section. Good. For real. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, yeah, so for those of you who are listening, thank you so much for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you all again next week. Ciao for now. Bye.